there will definitely be questions on the AP Calculus exam about derivative graphs. Most likely on the AB exam, there'll be a free response, and maybe on the BC exam as well. So let's take some time to review a lot of things that you could be asked about derivative graphs. Now, the first thing I want you to notice here <clears throat> is it says, let g be the integral from 0 to x of f of t dt. So let's just make sure we understand what that means. That means that here's 0. If I plug in a value like, let's say, 2, I'm finding the area from 0 to 2 of this graph. So you're finding out how much area is here enclosed in the function. Of course, it's negative area because it's below the axis. Okay? So that's, I call this an area collector. That's what this function is. Where the graph of f is consisting of four line segments and a semicircle with a radius of two. Okay, here's the first thing I would do with a question like this. When I see g defined as an area, I immediately write these other two things. g prime, so taking the derivative of g means taking the derivative of this and the derivative of an integral is that function inside with the bound plugged in. And I also know that g double prime is equal to f prime. And I like to actually go down here onto the graph and make a note that this is g prime of x. This is the derivative graph that I'm being asked about. Okay, so part a let me kind of put my work here for part A. It says find g of 3. Well, g of 3 would be the integral from 0 to 3 of the function, just plugging 3 in to g. So we have a semicircle. If it were the whole circle with a radius of 4, it would be pi times, excuse me, a radius of 2, pi times 2 squared, so 4 pi, but it's just a quarter of the circle. So I'm going to list that it's just this negative pi piece down here. And we were also asked to, you know, go from 0 to 3. This little triangle has an area of positive 1 half. So my overall area would be a negative pi plus 1 half. So that's g of 3. Now g prime of 3, well, remember, g prime is equal to f. So this is just f of 3. Well, that's just the value of the function at 3, and the value of the function at 3 is simply 1. And g double prime of 3 is saying, we'll find f prime of 3. Well, f prime of 3 is saying, what's the slope of this line? It's 1. Now, uh, the end of this question says, or state that it does not exist. A spot that you might not exist would be something like up here at 4. If I said find the g double prime of 4, so f prime of 4, there's a corner there, so it's not differentiable. So that's a situation where you'd say, oh, it doesn't exist. But everything works fine here at 3. All right. Where is g increasing? Well, important to remember that the word derivative is, for us, synonymous with the word slope. A function is increasing when its slope is positive. So we just say the derivative has to be positive. So I like to say I'm just looking for where the derivative is greater than 0, which is actually going to be our justification. So let's just list the couple spots where we have a positive derivative. That's it. That's all we have to do. Now concave up. We typically think of concave up as perhaps being like a second derivative question. And in fact, you know, g double prime is greater than zero. Um, that is what we usually look for for concave up is that the second derivative is positive. The AP exam would like us to use uh, the graph we were given. We weren't given g double prime. We were given g prime. So instead of saying the second derivative is positive, I would relate that to the first derivative. If the second derivative is positive, the first derivative is increasing. Similar to what, you know, we'd say if g prime is positive, g is increasing. So we just say, well, where is g prime increasing? Well, looking at the graph, we've got negative 4 to negative 2, and we've got 0 to 4. Yeah, just everywhere we saw 
this increasing. Okay. Now, the next question says, where is G increasing and concave down? I like to list both of my justifications here. G prime should be greater than zero. And G prime is decreasing. Okay. And then I, I got to look for the spots where I see both of those. So we have to see that the, um, the derivative is greater than zero, but decreasing. So I see that here. It's a different color there. Um, and I see it here. Greater than zero and decreasing. Uh, and those are the only two spots. So we would just say from negative seven to negative five and from four to five. All right, next, where is G at a local maximum? Well, maximums occur when the derivative changes from positive to negative, because remember, derivative means slope. So if we go from a positive slope to a negative slope, we had a maximum. So the derivative changes from positive to negative only the one time at negative 5. So we'd say, well, negative 5, because that's where g prime changes from positive to negative. So, of course, if it did the opposite, like over here, where it changed from negative to positive, this would represent a local minimum, all right? And I guess I should go back, you know, D, uh, to B, if it were decreasing, the derivative would be negative. Concave down would mean the derivative is decreasing, okay? Um, <clears throat> where does G have a point of inflection? Point of inflection is another thing that we often think about as related to the second derivative, but the key word I think for points of inflection is change. A point of inflection is where the function changes concavity, the derivative changes direction, and the second derivative changes signs. I'm just going to erase some of my work in there. So we're looking for where the derivative I'm going to put my justification first here, changes direction. It has a, it basically has a minimum or a maximum, a local minimum or maximum. So we're talking about negative 4 and negative 2 and 0 and 4, the spots where there was a directional change. So I'm going to list those, negative 4, negative 2, 0, and four. Okay. Next, find the equation of the line tangent to the curve. Well, put my work down here. A tangent line, of course, always needs a point. And we know that x is four. And of course, to get the, the y value, we just say, figure out what is g of four. And the slope, of course, is g prime of four, the derivative at this point. Well, actually, the derivative in this case is the easier part because, remember, this is the graph of the derivative. So if I say, well, what's the derivative's value at 4? It's right here. It's 2. So the slope is just 2. Now, g of 4, this is the integral from 0 to 4 of f of t dt. Remember, using our original area collector. So to figure that out, just kind of go back here for a second. Um, remember, this area down here was pi. And now we want this area. So triangle, base is 2, height is 2, area is 2. So this was a negative pi plus 2. So my equation would be y equals the slope x minus the x, and then plus, I'm going to put my y value here in parentheses, we had negative pi plus 2. And you could distribute. All right, last question. Find the absolute maximum and minimum of g of x. Okay, so absolute max and min, this is 
what's called or what we're going to use is called candidate test. And I'm going to I'm going to kind of slide some things out of the way so I have room to work, but let's just remember this is how we define g. It's the area from 0 to x. And let me slide everything out except the graph so we have some some room to work here. Okay. So I'm going to write down we are going to do candidate test. And candidate test, and let me also just remind, just write down that g of x was defined as the area from 0 to x of f of t. Okay. Candidate test says we list the possible spots we could have a max or a min. And if I can could really quickly, I'm going to just define this the way that I drew it. I'm going to define this graph as being just between negative 5 and 7. That's where my f of x is defined. Okay, so with that, if I have endpoints, I have to list those. Those are possible candidates. I could have had a max or a min at negative 7 or positive 5. I also should list all of the critical points, the spots where I could have local mins and maxes, like negative 5, negative 2, and positive 2. Now, before I proceed with figuring out which one is actually the max and min, let me just point out, you know, we, we can do some arguing here that, like, we know this is a maximum derivative change from positive to negative. We know this is a minimum because the derivative change from negative to positive. This is neither because the derivative didn't change signs, signs there. This is actually what's called a saddle point because it's a critical point that's all, also an inflection point. But... To argue that, to write that down, basically saying, this is why I'm not checking x equals negative 2, because there's no sign change. It could, it's easier to just check it and, and let the math speak for itself than to write a, a sentence about why you're not checking it. So please keep that in mind. I know it's not my answer. I know that negative 2 is, is not going to be the absolute max or min, but I'm going to just check it. Now, what I mean by checking it is we are actually going to find the value of the function at each of these spots. So we're going to find what is g of negative 7? And what is g of 5? What is g of negative 5? g of negative 2 and g of 2. Which of course means we're really just doing the integral from 0 to negative 7. Let me fill in the rest. All right, so you can see I've just listed all of those integrals. How I'm going to actually figure out the values that g takes on is by plugging those x values into g. Now, before I proceed on this, I'm going to do two things. The first thing I'm going to do is I am going to look at my integrals, and any time the bounds do not go from smallest to biggest, meaning tracking from like left to right, 0 to 5, I'm going to switch the bounds to go that way. So, for example, this one. I'm going to say, I don't want to go from 0 to negative 7. I'm going to go from negative 7 to 0. And when you switch the bounds, you just add a negative to your answer. Let me do that to this one, negative 5 and 0. Put a negative on the answer. And let me do it here, negative 2 and 0. Put a negative on the answer. Okay. The next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to fill out the rest of these areas because I know I'm going to need some geometry here to, uh, to figure these out. So let me leave that pi, but I'm going to uh, fill in the rest of these using some geometry. So we've got a uh, triangle, 3 by 2. So 3 times 2 divided by 2 is 3. Um, this one is going to be 2. This one is actually going to be 3 halves, or 1.5. 1, 1 Keep in mind the positive areas are above the line, the negative areas below the line. So let's proceed. Let's start here from negative 7 to 0. So I've got 2, positive 2, minus 3 halves. So 2 minus 3 halves is 1 half, and then minus pi. So I've got 1 half minus pi. But remember, I have a negative in front of it from right here. you got to put a negative in front of that area that I found. Next, the area from 0 to 5. 
Well, I had a negative pi and a positive 3. So negative pi plus 3. And I don't have to add a negative there because I had not switched the bounds. Okay. Next, from negative 5 to 0. So here we've got negative 3 halves minus pi. So negative 3 halves and minus pi. But then we're going to put a negative in front of it. Okay, because again, I changed the bounds. The next goes from negative 2 to 0. So just here, negative 2 to 0. Well, we have negative pi, but again, I'd had to change the bounds, so we're going to have negative, negative pi, like that. And finally, the area from 0 to 2, right here, which is just negative pi, and the bounds I didn't have to change, so it gets to change, just stay negative pi. Um, let me just simplify a couple of these. This is equal to pi. This is equal to 3 halves plus pi. Uh, this is equal to negative 1 half plus, plus pi. All right. So the maximum value that I can see is here at 3 halves plus pi. And the minimum value is negative pi. Now, the thing is, we are not done with this problem until we state that. All of this work that I've done is the justification for why these are the mins and maxes, but it isn't the answer until I say that this is the minimum and that this is the maximum. Do not forget on the AP exam after you went to all that work to actually label which it is. And be careful if they say, what is it? It wants the, the y value, the value of the function. It says, where is it? Well, then go back and say, well, it's at x equals 2, and it's at x equals negative 5. Okay? If this video helped you, please like and subscribe for more calculus help.